Hello, my name is David Hurst. I'm editor of the Middle East Eye and with me is Peter Oborn. We are here to interview the Right Honourable uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the former leader of uh, the Labour Party, about what was a tumultuous but important uh, leadership uh, of his party. Uh, Mr Corbyn, you have now had time to reflect uh, on what happened during your period as a uh, leader. What would you say are the achievements of your time in office? Uh, more than trebling Labour Party membership, changing the political debate on austerity into one of an investment-led economy and changing the political debate on the treatment of the poorest and most vulnerable people within our society. And the way in which the government eventually responded to the corona crisis indicates that everything I was saying in the general election in November and December about investment in housing, health, education and support for uh, manufacturing industry jobs has now come full circle and it's a Tory government that has in many ways, not perhaps in the way I would have totally wanted, but in many ways the principle of public spending in order to protect people in a crisis is now accepted as a political norm. It hasn't been ever since the um, austerity budget of 2010 that Osborne brought in. So I'm proud of that. I'm also proud of the way in which uh, we developed a, um, the idea of a national education service, developed the idea of a green industrial revolution, and perhaps not as developed as I would have wanted, but we did go in the direction of a human rights, peace and democracy based foreign policy, um, including the proposal of a War Powers Act and um, re-examination of our role in the world. And so I'm proud of a lot of what we achieved and in, in those areas, obviously very, very sad at the election result. In a sense, uh, Brexit was a bridge that was too too big for the Labour Party to traverse between strongly remain areas that were very strong for Labour, such as in London, in my own constituency, for example, and equally strong for Labour areas in the North East, South Yorkshire and the North West that were strongly for leave. I tried to bridge that gap with the proposal that we should um, do a trade deal with the European Union and put that alongside remain as a choice for the people and that was a decision taken at last year's Labour Party conference and so it turned out not to be possible um, so obviously I'm very very sad of that but I remain determined that personally I will spend the rest of my life as I spent my life up to now campaigning on the issues that I strongly believe in and um, representing people who are going through such terrible times in COVID. I'll just say this about COVID, because it does dominate everything. It's exposed the health inequalities around the world. It's exposed the interdependence of countries around the world. And it's exposed the risk to even healthy people in healthy countries of a, um, a pandemic like this. It's also exposed the inequalities in our own society. Where we're sitting now is in my office, in my constituency. Three minutes walk from here, there are several large housing estates. Those people going through lockdown, small flat, three or four children, no balcony, no play space. Very hard for them to say lockdown. A more affluent middle class family in a nice house, in the suburbs, garden, work at home, it's not that difficult. And these are the people that are suffering through this. And it's the black and minority ethnic communities and the oldest, poorest and most vulnerable people that are dying because of COVID. It's exposed the fissures in our society. We've got to heal them. Do you think that shift that you're <clears throat> describing leftwards, I, you've, you claim to have shifted the agenda left, leftwards, is a permanent shift or a temporary one under Boris Johnson? I think it's a permanent shift because um, when people go out every Thursday night to applaud the NHS, uh, it's very interesting. The whole country does it, everybody. And they recognise we need our National Health Service. Now, there might be arguments about how it's run and so on and so on, fine. But the principle of healthcare free at the point of need is one that is now universally accepted in the whole of society. And 
those people that are going out applauding the NHS are now demanding PPE, now demanding decent pay, and they're no longer tolerating horrible language like um, unskilled migrant workers who are care workers and cleaners. They suddenly realise if you didn't have a good cleaner in a hospital, you're going to get disease. They are skilled workers as well. I think I could add more to your list of achievements. For instance, you were ridiculed universal broadband was your call, and now the government's going to do that. You can argue very uh, convincingly that you won the argument in the election. And it wasn't just cor before, cor before coronavirus. Already that first Rishi Sunak budget incorporated an awful lot of your mm. fiscal arguments. Mm. We're, and indeed, you know, the Johnson government now is, is absurdly reckless compared to what, uh, what, 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 what you were proposing. But there is this but, you know, the, the election result uh, and those red wall seats, uh, you know, the former mining communities. How do you explain the fact that these absolute core Labour seats, ex-mining seats in many cases, switch from, from your Labour Party to the Johnson Tory party? The results we got there were bad in 2019, but in some of the constituencies, they were not great in 2017. We did very well in big urban areas in 2017, but we didn't do so well in some of those um, older industrial white working class areas, except where um, there had been a complete change in the structure of the local community. The sense of disillusionment in those areas with modern economy is huge and uh, they've also had a steady diet for five years of unbelievable attacks on the Labour Party, on me personally, and um, it had an effect. There's no question about that. It has an effect. If you're told day after day in your daily newspaper that the leader of the Labour Party is an evil person, something gets through. It's more than just the press, isn't it? I mean, in those areas, they were leave areas, they obviously felt that your message was not nearly strong yeah, enough. Yeah, they were not in favour of um, the offer we'd put forward of a, um, a referendum between an agreement with the EU and Remain. Uh, I was faced with a problem after 2016 uh, from the referendum then that the vast majority of Labour members, Labour Party members, were for Remain. Uh, the majority supported a concept of a second referendum, which was a huge issue, as you know, um, up until, um, uh, well, for a, it's for a long way through all this, it's been a huge issue. and. Um, a majority of Labour voters uh, were in favour of Remain, but a substantial minority, probably 40%, 35%, 40%, something like that, were, were for leave. And the Labour Party conference of uh, last year had this um, very difficult um, chasm it had to cross, and they came to a compromise that was agreed by... Uh, put forward by all of the unions, both those very strongly Remain unions like TSSA, Unison, and those very strongly Leave unions like um, ASLEF and the Bakers Union. Um, and the, the bigger unions were reflective of their membership on this. And so uh, it was a compromise that um, clearly didn't find favour with Labour voters in those areas. But had we gone in any other direction, I'm quite clear we would have lost support in London and the South East and there are, what, nearly 57, I think it is, Labour MPs in London, for example. So, so you were, you were damned if you do and damned if you don't. Whatever, whatever <clears throat> we'd done was going to be difficult. And um, in the election campaign, I was trying to point out that if we reach an agreement with the EU on trade, it would be about protection of workers' rights, environmental standards, consumer rights, and it would not be a bargain basement economy to please Donald Trump, which I suspect is what Boris Johnson was then trying to do. What he'll try and do now, I'm not entirely sure. And that fundamentally, whether we're in or out of the European Union, 
a Labour government led by us would be one that would want high quality jobs and an investment led economy, hence the National Investment Bank, hence the infrastructure investment, hence the Green Industrial Revolution, hence the broadband offer that we made during the election campaign. Um, and I tried to get that message across. Did you personally get Brexit wrong in the sense that uh, there's this <clears throat> persistent claim that you didn't campaign hard enough for yes in the referendum, that it was a bit of wishy-washy, uh, that it pleased virtually no one. Um, looking back on your time, are there honestly points at which you would say, actually, I should have done something else? Well, in the referendum in 2016, the Labour policy was for remain and reform of the EU. Because the EU, yes, it has um, quite good basic environmental standards, it has quite good intentions on workers' rights. Um, they're not as strong as they ought to be, but it also has a bit of a penchant for neoliberal economics. Look at the way it treated Greece, look at the uh, lectures that they've given to southern European countries during the financial crisis. And my view was that uh, if we remained in the European Union, uh, ours would be a voice for interventionist economics would be for full employment, would be for minimum welfare standards and a um, European-wide minimum employment standards because at the moment there are very low wages paid in Eastern Europe and that um, means that people leave Eastern Europe to work somewhere else and send the money home and uh, the, the issues of inequality and the treatment of those migrant workers when they come to Western Europe is disgraceful. So mine would have been a voice that would have been very, very different. So in the referendum campaign, uh, I was trying to articulate why I thought we should remain and reform the European Union. I was not going to go down the road of the Better Together campaign, which was so disastrous for Labour during the Scottish referendum. Um, but the media during the referendum campaign were quite interesting because from their point of view, the only show in town was the Blue on Blue War. So the stories day in, day out were between Cameron and Boris Johnson, basically, who were obviously on opposite sides on the um, uh, EU referendum issue. Did I campaign <coughs> hard enough? I did more visits, more, more miles, more meetings, more rallies than the rest of the Shadow Cabinet put together. I spoke on rallies on Perrinport Beach in Cornwall and I spoke to fishermen in Aberdeen. I travelled the length and breadth of the country on it. And so um, did I not do enough? I think that is frankly a bit unfair. Nobody said that during the campaign. Given what you're saying about a more um, human or worker-friendly Europe, do you now feel that you should have backed Mrs May's deal? Because if you, it was open to you at any moment to throw the weight of the Labour Party behind Mrs May's deal, which would have been a much softer Brexit, potentially even continued membership of the single market, conceivably the customs union. Did, did you ever, we, do you feel that in <clears throat> retrospect that was a mistake? We did go into negotiations with her and we were serious about it and we went on for six, seven weeks and uh, we had uh, teams of people involved dealing with the environmental aspects, dealing with the workers' rights aspects and dealing with future trade arrangements. We made quite a lot of progress on the workers' rights side of things. Uh, Becky led on that part, Becky Long-Bailey. We didn't make as much progress as I wanted on environmental standards and protection of those. And it seemed to me that um, that was the area that we could not reach agreement on. And so there were obviously a lot of discussions and I deliberately made sure the teams doing the negotiating were balanced between the individual views of people that were known to be remain and known to be leave in the talks that went on. And eventually the... Um, Shadow Cabinet concluded the talks were, <coughs> had reached their natural conclusion, so we, we then left them at that point. Uh, could we have done a deal? Um, I'm not sure that deal would have stuck within the Parliamentary Labour Party anyway if we had done a deal. The Parliamentary Labour Party, um, as you know, was uh, divided on the subject, and indeed the 
um, deal that finally went through, the Johnson proposal, the WAV bill that Johnson put up, went through with Labour support. Not mine, but with a minority of Labour MPs voted for it from strongly leave areas, thinking it would um, um, save their, their seats. But, but the thing is, now that we've got a, what looks like a, the ultimate hard Brexit, from no deal Brexit from Johnson government, a year ago, just over a year ago, there was a real there, there was on the table a a soft Brexit for Mrs May's government, which you could have led Labour towards. Well, Labour as a whole were not going to buy into that, and uh, there was uh, one of the litmus tests of this was the referendum issue. There was never a parliamentary majority for a second referendum. It, the closest it came was a minority of. 30, I think, or some, something around there. And there was never a parliamentary majority for that. And uh, looking back on it, could things have been done differently? Well, obviously things can always be done differently. Would the result have been any different? I'm not really sure. I think the problem was that um, many parts of this country have seen no investment for a very long time. They've seen deindustrialization that started in the 1980s have never seen the replacement of uh, cherished and uh, now lost industries with good quality jobs. And you have communities where there's very low levels of union membership, there's very high levels of um, insecure work, and very high levels of um, institutional poverty within those areas. And um, our economic success um, in the past has actually been predicated by cheap Chinese imports as much as anything else. And so the um, economic system that developed in this country during the 90s and early 2000s was actually a um, re ever reducing price of Chinese imports, a deindustrialization at the same time, a replacement of manufacturing jobs by service industry jobs and uh, we therefore have a fundamental economic weakness in Britain which is not the same particularly in Germany because you have a essentially a kind of um, agreement across the political spectrum in Germany that it is the job and duty of government to be involved in industry and major investment decisions, as to a slightly lesser extent in France. And so we have a structural problem which has to be addressed, which is why um, John MacDonald, Becky and myself made a great deal about investment in, uh, an, in a green industrial future for this country. And we're very serious about that. You were savagely attacked as leader. A lot, a lot of the attacks were against you personally. You were called a racist. You were called you 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 were called someone who tolerated anti-Semitism. As a uh, you uh, were attacked by the former uh, generals uh, for being a danger to the security of this of of, of the state. Were you prepared for that level, and you were also undermined by your own party? Uh, were you prepared, not least your deputy leader, were you prepared when you entered this uh, job for that level of personal hostility aimed at you? It's, it's, it's an irony that, in fact, a lot of the attacks were personal and they weren't policy-based. In fact, what you were saying uh, uh, received actually a good press, and what John McDonald said uh, received a good press. It was you personally that they were going for. Were you prepared for that? No, you can't be prepared for it. I mean, obviously, in the whole lifetime of political activity, I've had lots of issues where I think the media have been very unfair to me, and there was a, um, a process of personal abuse against me, against my wife, against my sons, family, and so on. And the obsessive nature of the British media was quite extraordinary, but also the way in which stories would suddenly take hold. I mean, uh, there was a, a time last year when apparently a group of civil servants said that I was um, unfit, that I was uh, not capable of concentrating on anything and that um, I wasn't um, medically or physically capable of doing the job. So I asked for a, a cabinet office inquiry into which civil servants had said this. 
and I was told in terms that no stone would be left unturned in sorting out who had actually made these foul allegations against me. Apparently there are still a lot of stones that need to be turned. Nobody has been identified as making these remarks. Um, How did you react to this between the four walls of your family? Were you tearing your hair out? Were you... No, I'm very calm. Were you calm? I'm a very calm person, which actually makes my, my family very annoyed. I had a look at some of your newspaper headlines uh, before coming here. But you must have got up early. <laughs> Jezza's jihadi comrades. Blood on his hands. Corbyn and the co commie spy. Corbyn's ISIS past revealed. Not, Corbyn not upset enough over Paris terror attacks. Jezza's jihadi comrades, apologists for terror. And um, I think when you uh, finally going to, came to election day, waking up to Corbyn as PM on Friday the 13th will be the start of a nightmare. So how, when you get this day after day, how do you deal with it? Well, I read the Daily Mail for election day after the election because uh, I got a copy that day and I read it a week later and I read it from cover to cover on a Sunday afternoon, a wet Sunday afternoon while I was tidying up my study. And I, at the end of it, I put the paper down. Wow, this Corbyn guy, God, he's evil. I wouldn't want to live in the same street as him. But what David Hurst was referring to earlier, you have on the one hand a very, very concentrated, calculated press campaign day after day at the same point, which is more concerning in many ways with these briefings from inside the military that you were a danger to security. Uh, and as uh, somebody brought up with the idea of the British system being that anybody can govern so long as they're elected, and it's the job of the military, the civil service, to work with them, to get briefings from inside the uh, armed security services and the armed forces, appearing, I think, mainly in the Daily Telegraph and elsewhere. That, what, what is your view of that? Well, the briefings were designed to undermine and designed to disagree with my world view. Uh, my world view is of uh, the fundamental problems facing this planet are the environmental crisis, are the levels of inequality across the planet, and <clears throat> that's the... Um, way in which Britain went into wars in Afghanistan and particularly Iraq have very serious long-term consequences and if at risk of quoting myself if you forgive me when I spoke at the huge rally in uh, Hyde Park on February the 15th 2003 I said this war if it goes ahead in Iraq will lead to the refugee flows of tomorrow the terrorism of tomorrow and the wars of tomorrow and the misery of tomorrow all across the region. You look at the refugee camps in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Libya, in Turkey, in Greece. All of those are a consequence of both the Afghan war and of the Iraq war. You haven't mentioned the Libyan intervention, where I think you are one of 12 MPs in the House of Commons who voted against, and that of course has led to the catastrophic uh, refugee flows, return of slavery, I mean, it's, it's been a... And we were accused of being stooges of Colonel Gaddafi. I never met Colonel Gaddafi. I'd never been to Libya, despite invitations from his government to go, but I said I was not prepared to visit Libya as a guest of the government. I would visit Libya independently if I could have independent access to any group I wanted to, because that's my basis of when I go anywhere. And... Um, so I never went there, but so far as I was concerned, the, the could and should have been agreements reached with Gaddafi. And indeed, Blair reached some levels of agreement with Gaddafi. We then got into the idea that somehow or other uh, bombing Libya would um, bring about a peace and security. What it's done is unleashed proxy wars in Libya now with Turkey supporting the... Um, recognised government or recognised by some people, other Middle Eastern states um, supporting those that are opposed to that particular government. We've got a ghastly civil war going on in there, compounded by the 
numbers of very desperate people that have ended up in Libya, who've come from Senegal, who've come from other parts of West Africa where they're living in terrible poverty, Burkina Faso, and so on. And you've got really there a microcosm of all of the world's problems and the deaths of thousands over the past decade trying to cross the Mediterranean to get to a relative place of safety at Lampedusa or somewhere else um, in Europe. And so my view was the bombing of Libya would actually make the situation worse. Where was I wrong? I was pilloried at the time. Were, were you a tough enough leader? Did you have enough teeth as a leader? Did you tolerate attacks on you? For instance, Margaret Hodge called you a, a racist to your face inside the House of Commons. She repeated that in The Guardian the next day. Shouldn't you have sued? Shouldn't you have said and defended yourself and said, no, I'm not a racist, prove it? Well, I do defend myself by pointing out my record on opposing racism in any form whatsoever uh, in society, and I have done all of my life. Was I too tolerant of people? Well, that's an interesting question. My style of leadership is very different to others. I'm, I didn't want to be a dictator. I wanted to be a, a leader that built by consensus. And, um, but there I, was no consensus <coughs> in the Labour Party. Half of them were desperately trying to get you out. Yeah. Well, no the coup that took place in 2016 was um, a dramatic time. Uh, the referendum result was what we all know, and a few days later, there were um, I dismissed Hillary Benn as uh, shadow foreign secretary because he had written an article in the Observer attacking me, which was pub published, of course, and um, others then resigned, and there was then. Um, a meeting of the Parliamentary Labour Party which passed a motion of no confidence in me. I pointed out that I'd been elected by the party membership, not by the Parliamentary Labour Party, and that as leader I would seek support from the party members. A challenge was mounted, as you know, and I was re-elected with a larger majority. Um, in 2016, 300,000 people voted for me to be remaining as party leader, despite all the attacks of that year. Well, it was less than a year since I'd, I'd been first elected. Um, the problem is the Parliamentary Labour Party is obviously of finite size. It, you can only be a member if you've been elected to Parliament. And um, I had to work with the Parliamentary Labour Party that was there in order to fulfil the various appointment positions. And I uh, did appoint uh, a balanced shadow cabinet. Um, and then after the 2017 election, I changed the shadow cabinet quite a lot and brought in uh, a lot of uh, new people and new faces. And it worked together actually quite well, um, despite all the endless debates we had over Brexit. We probably had as many debates over Brexit as the cabinet itself had. Um, it's a style of leadership issue. I think leaders who dictate tend to isolate themselves and therefore everything uh, falls upon them and it doesn't motivate others to be involved. And so what I wanted to do was create a more democratic atmosphere within the Labour Party and the Labour movement as a whole. Could things have been done differently? Obviously you can do things differently. That was my way of doing things. That was my whole um, lifestyle of doing things. But do I have um, strong principles that I won't deviate from? Yeah, I do. Of course I do. I believe in social justice. I believe in environmental sustainability. I believe in trying to bring about a world of peace. I do believe that the poverty and insecurity in this country and across the world is actually a danger to everybody. Corona crisis has proved that to be the case. The internal Labour Party report, uh, which has been leaked, contains a great deal of evidence that there were elements inside the machinery of the party that were actively working against you, particularly uh, before the very good result you had in 2017. Do you have anything to say about that? I'm not, I won't comment on the leaked report itself. Um, because that will uh, be subject of inquiry and so on. But what I would say is that uh, when I was nominated to be leader of the party in 2015, 
It was a very difficult process to get on the ballot paper, but I made it easily with 90 seconds to spare when the last nomination was made. And so I was a candidate, and at that point the bookmakers gave me 200 to 1 chance of winning. I wished I'd put money on it. I'm not a, not a betting man, but, you know, anyway. Um, I always knew that there was a culture in the Labour Party that uh, was not a healthy one of an almost self-perpetuating bureaucracy. All organisations have a degree of self-perpetuating bureaucracy uh, about them. And uh, I wanted to change the way in which the party operated by changing from being a solely bureaucratic machine that administered the party, disciplined members and observed the rules and so on, into a community organising base of the party. And um, I, when I was first elected, I met the um, executive board of the party and the general secretary at the time, Ian McNichol and so on, and I said, I'm not here to start a war with you. I'm not here to get rid of you all. What I want to do is develop the party in this kind of direction. And um, we had the utmost resistance to bringing in community organising, which is where Ian McNichol and I finally parted company. Um, and in the 2017 campaign, there were um, people saying, this has got to be a defensive campaign. There's no way we can win it, there's no way, we're too far behind and so on. And I said, look, it's a long campaign, we can go out there, we can mobilise a bigger electorate, we can mobilise people who will see hope in what we're doing. And then Andrew Fisher uh, was the main author of um, For the Many, Not the Few, and that was an absolute game changer. And I realised when we launched that manifesto, we had a real chance of winning. We did it at Bradford University. And I was standing there in the, in the atrium of the university where we launched it, and all above there were various galleries in the, in the building, all of which had glass screens in front of them. And it was like that last scene out of The Graduate, when Dustin Hoffman is waving through the glass in the church. And I looked up there, and every single gallery had students listening to what we were saying. Listening to what we were saying. And um, it, it was clear to me that the leaked manifesto, I was really angry about it being leaked, it was absolutely not me that leaked it, um, had had actually a much better reaction than we expected, and the support for that manifesto was huge. The party bureaucracy was so leaden-footed, it couldn't appreciate what was actually happening on the ground. As so every time I got back to was London... It, was it leaden-footed or was it hostile? Well, Interesting question. I took it, I, your earlier question about my innate generosity, I said, look, think of what's going on out there. There are a lot of people getting involved in politics for the first time. There's more people involved in our campaign than ever been involved before. There are people just forming their own campaigns to support Labour candidates. Think about it. This is the great moment. And when Theresa May said um, something like, Corbyn's afraid to go to the northeast, as she addressed a rally of 20 people at a golf club. We then organised a rally, which was, we were going to do anyway, outside the Sage in Gateshead. We had 10,000 people there at two days' notice. That was a sign of what was happening. And um, I obviously deeply regret the result of 2017 because we came so, so close. We were, maybe we weren't going to get an overall majority. That would have been a huge, a huge jump. But I thought we were in a position where we would have formed a minority government. And I made the point all along, we would not form a coalition with the SNP or with anybody else. We would form a minority government and take our chance. I once spoke to a, I remember a few years ago now, I had a conversation with somebody who had been inside Conservative Central Office and he said something really interesting, which was when they saw you go out after the terrible tragedy of the, of the Manchester bombing and say you have to, you went and said something along the lines that British foreign policy carries its share of responsibility for this. He said in central office, they watched this and they said, we've won the election. 
And they realised two days later from the polls that no, you, what you'd said had really resonated. Is that the sense you got That to? was the toughest decision we had to take during that campaign. The Manchester bomb was appalling and abominable in every way, obviously. And I remember I was um, in Doncaster when it happened. We were on our way from Hull to Doncaster. And um, we then stayed overnight there. And the Prime Minister called me at about one o'clock in the morning and we discussed what had happened. Then I went to Manchester the next day to join in the silence and commemoration outside the town hall. And um, then the campaigning was suspended for a few days and um, we then discussed it all. And I was of the view that we had to have a considered response to this, which said there is an element, an element of British foreign policy that is causing this in, in, in Britain. And I decided I would make the speech and we made it um, on the following Friday morning, I think it was. Um, at the Mechanics Institute in London. And uh, I was very strongly advised by a lot of people, don't do it, don't do it, no, this is wrong, this will actually play against us. And I said, no, it's the honest response to give. It's a serious response, it's not condoning in any way whatsoever, what happened was abominable and appalling. And so I made the speech in the morning um, and uh, waited for the reaction. And uh, a few hours later, I didn't know they were doing it, YouGov did a telephone poll which came out with 60% saying Corbyn's on the right lines here. And uh, I stand by every word I made in that speech. And um, I think it was the right thing to do because it also helped to frame a debate about the kind of foreign policy we had. And I did then, uh, I'm not sure the sequence of events, but I also did during that campaign a quite long event at um, Chatham House in which we had a discussion about world affairs, about refugees, inequality and poverty and so on. And um, the need to have uh, the basis of our foreign policy being respect for human rights in every country in the world. And I've always sought in all my meetings with any leaders to raise issues of human rights. So when I met President Xi, I raised issues of human rights in China. We got into a very long discussion about collective versus individual human rights because the Universal Declaration of 1948 actually recognises both. As far as he was concerned, it was all about collective rights and housing and education and health and, and so on, and not about individual rights. I had a, um, a meeting with um, Prime Minister Modi and raised a number of issues about human rights in India, in which um, I can't pretend we reached agreement, uh, but it was an interesting discussion. I also met President Obama at, for a quite long meeting, I had a, an hour with uh, President Obama, and well, he was still present at the time, he was on the state visit to, to Britain. And it was a very interesting discussion and um, about um, what his view was and his concerns about the powers of um, global corporations over national government. And um, I sort of complimented him on Obamacare. And he looked at me and he said, that's very generous and very kind of you, but I think it's my greatest failure because I wanted a real health service like you've got. Um, so whoever I meet, whoever they are, I raise these issues, however uncomfortable it is. Because if you don't raise it when you've got the chance, what's the point? You're a lifelong uh, anti-racist campaigner, um, and yet you never shrug off the repeated claims that you tolerated anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, that anti-Semitism was a problem in uh, the Labour Party. Uh, and you apologised. Um, did you, do you uh, regret uh, uh, not fighting uh, that smear uh, more stringently? And do you accept that um, you were targeted principally because, not because of any inherent problem in the Labour Party or that 
you consorted in any way with anti-Semites, but that you were a lifelong supporter of the Palestinian cause. Look, let's unpick that. Anti-Semitism is an evil and is wrong. Jewish people have suffered anti-Semitism from the 13th century or before. You look at the books, the legend of the wandering Jew, the way in which Jewish people were expelled from Britain in the 13th century, came back under Cromwell, um, but were nevertheless still discriminated against. Anti-Semitism is rife and has been historically in Europe and indeed around the world. It is evil, it is wrong. The Nazis exploited anti-Semitism for their advantage, decided that all the problems of the Weimar Republic were nothing to do with the chaos of the Weimar Republic or the results of the um, conference at the end of the First World War, the Versailles Conference, um, but instead all the problems, all the fault of the Jews. They started by opposing Jewish people, they, they then moved on to beating up Jewish businesses, they moved on to killing people, and that ended up with the extermination camps at Dachau and Bergen-Belsen and all the others. It is an absolutely appalling history of where racism and anti-Semitism lead to. I grew up in a family that were obviously opposed to racism in any form. My mum was there at Cable Street in 1936. That's the sort of background I come from. When I became leader of the Labour Party, I, was, um, I discovered that there were a small number of cases where people had been accused of anti-Semitic work remarks within the party and there should be a process for dealing with them. I asked for what the process was and I was not very satisfied. I didn't feel we had a very strong or robust process for uh, dealing with this and um, then um, allegations were made about people making anti-Semitic remarks at meetings and trolling people and being abusive to Jewish Labour MPs absolutely, totally unacceptable in any form. The numbers involved were actually very small. So I asked Shami Chakrabarti to do an investigation into this and produce a proposal, which she did, which was to have a stronger governance unit, have it independent of the party leadership, and that cases should be referred to them for process. I had a very strong view in my office that I was not to be the judge, jury and decision maker on each case. Any case that was brought to my attention, and some were, people wrote in and things like that, I didn't deal with it, I passed it straight on to the governance and legal unit. That um, process needs to be examined very closely, how efficiently they dealt with those or didn't deal with those. and. Um, the party policy has to be one that we don't tolerate um, anti-Semitism in any form. It also has to be clear that we do not tolerate any form of racism within our party any more than any other party should. So the allegations of Islamophobia in the Conservative Party also deserve to be investigated. And uh, unless we, as a society, recognize the cancer that racism in any form is, then we're weakened as a society because that leads to wasted opportunities, it leads to damaged lives, it leads to violence um, against individuals on our street. And but why uh, did this happen under your leadership as opposed to Ed Miliband's? That the objective evidence says that there are actually more incidents of anti-Semitism under a Jewish leader than there was under you, before all this started. Well, it came up very heavily against me, and uh, I believe... Why you? They attacked me all the time on this. Um, I think it is wrong, because I think I'm the one that actually introduced a process for dealing with it. Um, there has to be an examination of the way in which that process operated. I then realised there was a logjam building up in the party on individual cases, and so I proposed the expansion of the National Constitutional Committee, which was duly done in order to deal with cases more quickly. I also introduced a a system where egregious cases could be dealt with very quickly but still within the ambit of rules of natural justice. And so uh, I feel that the attacks on me have been extremely unfair. I mean, pa Panorama says that, well, contains very serious 
claims that you actually impeded anti-Semitism investigation inside the Labour Party. That is absolutely not the case. I was the one that introduced a system to ensure they were properly dealt with. There was What I inherited was a system that was not effective, that wasn't clear, that wasn't definitive, and that's why I asked uh, Shami Chakrabarti to do a report, and um, she also um, uh, recommended in that there should be a process of education as well as to what anti-Semitism is or what any form of racism is and the use of language and behaviour. Um, and historically in Britain, the tolerance of anti-Semitism is huge. I mean, you think Churchill's anti-Semitic remarks are all through his life and the degrees of acceptance of a sort of anti-Semitism uh, throughout our history is huge and I think there has to be a challenge to that on any form of racism and that is what I try to do within the party as party leader and it's what I spend my life doing. But do you accept that as a result of uh, this whole storm that never really died away and is continuing as we speak um, with the future publication of the uh, report by the Equalities Commission. Remember, the Equalities Commission is now an arm of government. Remember that. Why do, you, of... why do you say that? Because I think it's quite significant that um, the Conservative government has, A, underfunded the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. Indeed, I went on demonstrations outside its office to demand better funding of it when it took place. And for some reason, which I don't fully understand, they decided to take it away from its independent status and make it um, part of a government machine. And I think it's quite important. And had we won the election, I would have... Um, reinstated the principle a of its complete independence but also of a wider Equalities and Human Rights Commission so it dealt with uh, maybe in separate arms of it um, age discrimination gender discrimination and and so on within our society because I do think I do think the Equalities Act of 2010 was an important step forward in the, in the direction we should go as a society. Are, are you suggesting that that could colour their decision into the Labour Party? Let's see what happens. Do you accept that as a result of you having lost this battle uh, uh, to clean up the Labour Party or uh, that, that, that the label that there is an anti-Semitism problem specifically in the Labour uh, Party stuck under your leadership that has now become much more difficult to campaign for the Palestinian cause. And all sorts of people, uh, including a, a very distinguished Guardian uh, columnist, are now being accused of anti-Semitism simply and solely because they're supporting sticking up for the Palestinian cause. Shami made it very clear in her report that anti-Semitism was completely unacceptable and that in any discussion of the issues of Palestine, of Israel-Palestine relations, or of the future of Palestinian people, it is perfectly possible to have those discussions without indulging in any form of anti-Semitism, and it is. And I indeed have been, as you know, a member of Palestine Solidarity Campaign, and uh, I've been at Palestine Solidarity Campaign meetings where um, somebody has made anti-Semitic remarks, and they've been removed from the meeting as a result. PSC did that, they're very clear about that. And, and, the, and the right to be, of course. Um, and so I have um, always supported the need for recognition of the state of Palestine, and I proposed that, and it was in both of our manifestos, and I hope that will remain their full recognition. I've also made it very clear my opposition to the Trump plan, because I think if the Trump plan goes ahead, then the chances of a two-state solution just disappear with it, because in fact there would be no contiguous Palestinian area at all. There would be a series of islands of um, what would be called Palestine, which would be Ramallah and Jericho and one or two other places. I mean, it is a proposal which essentially is Netanyahu's dream of taking over virtually the whole of the West Bank. Uh, do you think that the British government, the Foreign Secretary and the Middle East Minister have been, um, have, have protested enough about this plan? I don't think they've protested enough about this at all. And um, 
it's quite interesting that a cross-party group of MPs have um, written on this, and I support that letter, um, saying that there has to be the strongest possible protests. My worry is that the Trump plan is so extreme that it will be rejected. But, and I say this sadly, but in reality the Trump plan is actually a continuation of the demands of the right in Israel politics for a very long time. And that the danger is there would be some slightly lesser version of the Trump plan proposed where there's not quite as much expansion, not quite as many settlements. And this will be somehow seen um, as a victory. The whole process has been that um, Israel has continuously put in more and more settlements, denied Palestinian people access to land, built a wall through farms that have made it impossible to be, run a sustainable farm, and put the people of Gaza uh, under siege. And I've been in Gaza, I've been in the West Bank, I've been in Israel, I've spoken to people of, of all sorts of views there. And it's very hard to put yourself in the place of somebody else. But I remember the first time I went to Gaza, I met this, um, this was in the 90s, I met this lady who was, it turned out, exactly the same age as my late mother. Exactly the same age, you know, within a month or so. Was, I don't know how the conversation got onto that. And I thought- We could bring our mothers with us wherever we go, Jeremy. Indeed we do, this is true. And so I sort of reflected on the um, rich and varied life that my mother led. And, um, and then I said to this lady, what's your life been like then? And she described the village that she came from in 1948, which is now where Israel is. And she said since then she's been living in Gaza. And she's grateful to the UN Relief and Works Agency for educating her children and providing food and water supplies and so on. But she says, we've been living under siege ever since. And, and I said, what about your sons? None of them lived with her, none of them lived anywhere near. They were away somewhere, one was in prison, one was abroad and so on and so on and so on. And you just reflect on her life and then look at the lives of of young people in, in Gaza. Gaza is the most educated place in the world. The highest level of a population with degrees is Gaza. The highest level of people with PhDs is Gaza. They can educate themselves, there's great universities and colleges and so on, but they can't travel anywhere. And so that sense of isolation, I remember going to um, a primary school at the top end, the northern part of the Gaza Strip. You can go to the top floor of this primary school. You can look one way and you can see the fence with Israel beyond it. You can look the other way and you can see the sea. Out in the sea, you can see the Israeli boats that are preventing the Gaza fisher people going further out. And the other side of the fence in Israel, you can see cars, you can see life, you can see irrigated land and so on. And these kids have been brought up in this school with under, very good school, but underfunded and so on. And last year, no, year before, I was in Jordan at uh, visiting a school in the refugee camp there. And I asked the head teacher, how much money do you have to run the school? And he gave me the figures and I sort of did a rapid calculation in my head. And it was quite a good secondary school. I met the school council, the students, and impressive, is in Jordan. And um, <clears throat> I worked out that his capitation funding was much less than half that would be available in a secondary school in Britain. And he said it's going to be halved again straight away and it will be cut more and the school may have to close in two months time uh, because the US at that point, Trump had cut the funding for, for UNRWA. And so it's that sense of anger amongst Palestinian people uh, that I'm not sure people outside fully understand. But also, there's an underestimate of the feelings of people in Israel against it. Last week I was on a conference call with um, people from both uh, Palestine and Israel, 
people from Marat's party, people from Gush Shalom, people from Bet Shalem, different peace groups within Israel who said there was a lot of anger and concern that the Trump plan will actually make their lives more dangerous, will make the situation for people in Israel more, more dangerous. So the Trump plan is, I think, an absolute disaster waiting to happen. I mean, you've had a, a very bruising, it must have been exhausting, morally challenging four or five years. What do you, what's your, how, how do you plan to spend your future? Well, as busy as ever. Yeah. Um, I am the MP for Islington North and very proud to be so. And um, I have never neglected my constituency and never would and didn't while I was leader of the party either. This is one of the big arguments in the office. I said, Friday's is constituency day. I'll be there. They said, yeah, but we'd like you to. I said, no, I will be there. Maybe I'll travel somewhere in the evening or whatever, but I always, and I think it's important for two reasons. One is because it's your duty. If you're elected to represent an area, you have to represent an area, and you can't, there's no substitute for actually being there and getting involved in the random conversations on the doorstep, on the street, and so on about people's lives. It keeps you grounded, it keeps you regular. And um, so I've done that. So I'm doing plenty of that. I've been volunteering at all the food banks um, in the constituency during the uh, corona crisis. And um, I'm doing um, a lot of work on um, international issues, peace and justice and human rights, and working on environmental issues as well. So I'm extremely busy, as I've always been, and um, I have never given up my allotment either, and won't. <laughs> and indeed, I'm about to plant out all the maize next weekend. It's growing nicely in the back garden, and it will be taken up to the allotment. Growing there. We grow two varieties of maize. One is F1 hybrid maize, which is developed in Europe and grows very fast and looks very good and all the rest of it. But we have a far more interesting maize. That's Mexican maize in honor of Laura. Um, and it is multicolored and it's beautiful to eat. But it's slower growing in this country. But it grows very well in Mexico. We just need a bit more sun here. Well, it looks like it'll be a hot summer. What hopes. Thank you, Mr. Corbyn, for a very full interview and good answers. Um, and um, you can watch this uh, on uh, www.middleeasteye.org uh, and all our associated platforms. And thanks also for Peter for joining me. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.